Excellent. That's great. Good morning. Good evening. Uh, good afternoon uh, to everybody. Thank you very much indeed to this uh, carefully selected audience. I'm very, very grateful that so many of you have joined so promptly and, uh, and also that you're giving up your time, some of you, when you should be very rightly tucked up in bed. Uh, so it's my pleasure, Nick Lambert, uh, to welcome you uh, to this governance of the High Seas Ecosystems Workshop, uh, building on the work that uh, we've been doing with the Sargasso Sea Commission uh, as to whether or not big data and AI can be used for better understanding of situational awareness of management of uh, high seas sea spaces uh, using the Sargasso Sea as a case study. And it's an absolute pleasure to have you all here today. Um, just a very few quick words about domestics. It's a small group of people, deliberately small, as I said. Um, so we're using the common chat room. Please do uh, put your comments or your questions in the chat room as you go along, as we go along. Uh, our panelists will endeavor to answer them. Um, and so will our, our speakers uh, will endeavor to answer them as you put them up. It's also a great record for us uh, of comments and questions uh, when we conclude the meeting, because we do have further steps as, as Dr. David Freeston will, will mention uh, later on and we will use that information to support those further steps. Um, I will uh, is a, also particularly highlight the fact that uh, President uh, James Michel is our, our keynote speaker. It's a real privilege to have him with us. Uh, and so I will break from the agenda slightly and give the opportunity for questions to the president um, after his opening, his keynote remarks, uh, either via the chat room or orally. Uh, just so that we uh, we have that chance of, of capturing um, his time and wisdom. Um, so just bung your thoughts and comments into the chat room and we'll deal with it accordingly. To our speakers, please, cameras off when you're not speaking, cameras on when you are speaking, and please be uh, ready to bring your slides up um, as your predecessor concludes. I think that is all by way of uh, welcome. Um, I, as I said earlier, I will adjust the agenda uh, depending on how things proceed, and we'll squeeze the panel a bit um, towards the end, uh, if necessary, or run over. So with no further ado, it's my pleasure to invite Dr. David Freeston, the Executive Secretary of the Sargasso Sea Commission, and the brain behind the project. Uh, David, the floor is yours uh, for your comments uh, and observations as we kick off this workshop. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much. Uh... Uh, Nick, and uh, my thanks to you and your team for all the hard work you've done uh, on this uh, against a very tight time frame. So we're most uh, delighted. I've got some a few slides to share. Everybody knows that I'm notorious for having too many, uh, but I'm going to move through them fairly quickly. But let me first of all, first of all, join Nick and uh, in welcoming you all, and particularly, you know, warm welcome, welcome to. Uh, uh, to President James Michel for agreeing to, to speak to us and to our very distinguished panelists. Um, and my, my thanks also because this project wouldn't have happened without the support of IUCN uh, and also the Swedish government. So my thanks to them as well. And I should also thank particularly Faye, who's been doing all the admin and setting this up. Right, well, let me just say a few words about the Sargasso Sea Commission. Many of you know me, many of you know the work of the Commission, but there are a few people who haven't perhaps are quite so up to, up to speed as, as others. So a little few words of introduction as to how this, um, what we do and how this project came about. So Sargasso Sea Commission really uh, uh, formed after the signing of the Hamilton Declaration in 2014. This is the, this is the Sargasso Sea in the North Atlantic subtropical gyre, um, a pretty good organogram, which sort of explains all the uses and the, the uh, and the uh, the benefits which mankind derives from from the Sargasso Sea, not not uh, the least of which, of course, the ecosystem benefits from this uh, 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 holopelagic uh, weed, which uh, seaweed, which uh, uh, is a major uh, carbon sequestration uh, uh, operation. But also the the values involved, and those values are some sort of fairly old, but. The, the, uh, it's the only place in the world where the European and American eels, sanguillid eels, spawn, or the thought to spawn, and the values of that uh, uh, that trade is is enormous. 
uh, as I said, 2014, we, we celebrated and we're coming up for the, the eighth anniversary of the signing of the Hamilton Declaration on Collaboration for the Conservation of the Sargasso Sea in Bermuda. Uh, we now have 10 government signatories on which I set there, but we also have a lot of uh, supporters and fellow travelers. I put the Netherlands, um, Sweden, of course, who supported this, South Africa, but I should also add France, who's also been a very uh, major financial supporter and others, I think, as well, and a lot of observer organizations. This is the area which we set out as being uh, the area for, for what we call the area of collaboration. It's two million square miles. So at the moment, it's 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 regulated by a very haphazard system, which is the high seas governance system. Uh, and really, we're looking at ways in which we can find out data about what's going on there and also human activities. So this is where we've been investing or hope to invest quite heavily in this uh, in the, the technology uh, to actually to understand how we could actually make some difference in an area this large. Uh, the, the Hamilton Declaration sets up a fairly light governance structure. We have a meeting of signatories. Um, we meet in COVID, we've been meeting every two months. In the old days, it was every year. So that's been a, a benefit to us. The Sargasso Sea Commission is unusual in that it's a, uh, in, in, uh, individuals appointed in their personal capacity or by the Bermudan government on the, uh, on the, on the um, uh, recommendations of the, of the signatories. Uh, and a light secretariat, as you see both of us, <laughs> Faye and I there, here yeah, with a, uh, a charity status. And those are our commissioners, uh, seven commissioners from the different signatory states. I haven't got time to go through them all, but you may recognize many of them. Uh, and these are our collaborating partners, formal collaborating partners, many others help us in many ways, but it's a very wide, more than 35 uh, organizations, both from academic organizations, NGOs, but also uh, uh, government institutions as well, which are parties to this. And the reason that we're here really is because we have in 2020, we were uh, awarded a, a, a $3 million grant by the Global Environment Facility, the first to actually look at uh, the, uh, uh, to, to do uh, analytical work on a high seas ecosystem. We're calling it the economically and biologically significant high seas area because it is important for all those purposes. All the, all the players there are listed in the, uh, in the, uh, in, in the logos. The, it's a GF project, Global Environment Facility, and our implementing agency is UNDP and uh, IOC and UNESCO is, is uh, the executing agency. And this basically, without going too much into this, um, uh, it's uh, the two key areas, one and three there, the an ecosystem diagnostic analysis for the entire Sargasso Sea ecosystem. Uh, and this is based on work which has been done for large marine ecosystems in coastal waters, which was called a transboundary diagnostic. So this is the first high seas ecosystem diagnostic analysis. And that leads to eventually the, the development of a strategic action program which will define the management or stewardship measures and associated areas for, for management of this, of this high seas system. So that's a, a really important sort of uh, proposals going, going forward, which will be endorsed then by our partners, particularly by, we hope, our governance signatories. And that's been supported by another uh, project, which is supported by the French, as I mentioned, called Sargedom, because it's both Sargasso Sea and the Thermal Dome. Uh, these are the partners, three million over over five years of which were nearly a million US is, is allocated to us. Uh, so that's, I'm conscious that I'm just starting us off. So again, my very warm welcome, my thanks to, to Nick for taking on the role of, uh, of uh, uh, chairing this and uh, I'll pass it back to you. You're on mute, Nick. Yes, my competence goes before me. Um, uh, thank you very much indeed, David. That was a great summary. And uh, there will be a chance to talk to David and ask questions during the plenary discussion. And of course, you can please put any comments you have up in the chat and he will summarize next steps uh, after the uh, report team have reported. So it's now my great pleasure to uh, introduce President James Alex Michel, uh, who I would argue is one of the leading if not leading uh, global influencer uh, when it comes to the blue economy and thinking about our, our seas and oceans. Um, I'm a huge fan of his work. I've uh, read his Rethinking the Oceans book twice, 
There are a few uh, phrases that stand out in it. Uh, chapter one always catches my eye because it says we are all islanders now. He means everybody on the planet. And uh, he also says uh, we believe that island societies are the flag bearers for human development. And I think there's a huge amount of truth in that sentence. And clearly, uh, the Sargasso Sea is surrounded by island societies of all sizes from continent the US uh, down to Bermuda. Uh, James, thank you so much for joining us. I really, really appreciate your time and we look forward to hearing your remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anik. But uh, I decided I'm very delighted to be able to participate uh, and make a humble, my humble contribution to this, I would say, very important uh, webinar. So now addressing the, uh, the audience, I to space in pursuit of reforms have been unprecedented, have taken unprecedented momentum. Billions of dollars are being spent on uh, technologically advanced launch infrastructures and vehicles, as well as with artificial intelligence algorithms providing real time big data. But down here, we have our ocean occupying almost 72% of our planet's uh, surface. It is what distinguishes from other planets in our solar system. It is our life support, yet very little is known about our oceans. In fact, vast portions of it remain uncharted and unregulated, and uh, both in terms of reach and also of deepness. More than in the ocean are still unclassified. SDG 14, Life Below Water, focuses on uh, conserving and uh, sustainably using the oceans, seas, and marine resources. There cannot be effective ocean conservation without good understanding based on reliable data. I will come to this in a moment, but for now, I would like to focus on the importance of having processes legally binding of our ocean without being too much on the facts, which I am sure you know all too well. There are so many reasons why ocean governance and protection should top our agenda. Ocean governance characterizes who, how, where marine resources are used and protected. Almost every aspect of our ocean related activities are guided by local and international policies. The fisheries sector, for example, is uh, to some extent guided by boundary delimitation, fishing rights, quotas, subsidies, stock agreement, etc. These instrument attempts to put some order in what are often messy and complex state of affairs. But the high seas outside the EZ of nations is a free for all marine spaces with no enforceable regulations. Ocean governance contributes towards maritime security and peace. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea uh, has been uh, instrumental to that effect by establishing the basis for the conduct of maritime commerce, codifying the rules of freedom of navigation that are essential to national security. 
countries to conserve, regulate, and exploit marine resources of their neighboring waters and continental shelf for the benefit of the environment and the economy. It outlines the key maritime zones, ranging from internal waters controlled by individual sovereign states to the high sea hindered uh, freedom of navigation. Uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, climate change now. Coming from uh, a small island developing state, or rather, I would say, a large ocean state, one of uh, is climate change, which is all impacting negatively on the lives and livelihoods across the globe, which uh, over 40% of the world's population being highly vulnerable to it. I am deeply troubled, albeit uh, not surprised, report that concludes that many of the impacts of global warming are now simply irreversible. We know that uh, the ocean regulates climate and provide vital services to the planet. The ocean is like the umbilical cord that supports life. The ocean produces about 50% of the world's oxygen, oxygen and absorbs one third of global carbon. Furthermore, it absorbs heat and feeds the weather systems. Scientists have warned that tipping points are being reached and warming and uh, sea level rise. It is a fact that 64% of the oceans lie beyond national jurisdictions. Managing countries' respective exclusive economic zones is proving to be challenging. Managing the high seas remains very problematic, especially due to the size, lack of ownership, and the complexity and inconsistencies of ocean governance frameworks. It is also a fact that several detrimental activities like large-scale unregulated fishing, deep sea mining, etc., take place on the high seas and in some cases on the seabeds as well. Uh, internationally, binding legal instruments that regulate the ocean stresses which uh, destroy marine ecosystems and interfere with uh, ocean processes are needed. International policies that will ensure that the ecosystems and resources of the high seas remain in good shape for the benefit of generations to come. Ocean governance also encourages cooperation at the local, regional, and international level. There are some good initiatives that have emerged, such as the Food and Agricultural Organization's Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries, which aims to set international standards for sustainable practices regarding living aquatic resource. The Seychelles has negotiated a unique agreement with our southern neighbor Mauritius to jointly care for and develop a continental shelf known as the Mascarene Plateau, which connects our two uh, nations. These are joining the call for ocean action through initiatives like the 30 by 30 movement to get governments to commit to at least 30% of marine territories as meaningful protected areas by the year 20. will be a major achievement for our planet, helping to build the resilience of ocean life to adapt to climate change and buffer it from other threats like overfishing. I am proud has already achieved this milestone 
since March 2020. And as an ocean ambassador for the Pew Better Really Ocean Legacy, I would like to reiterate the call for more countries to join us in promoting the development in protected areas. There is also the Great Blue Wall, which is a coalition of partners joining forces for a nature people movement under the leadership of the Western Indian Ocean states. IUCN, the main coordinator, and the United to develop a regenerative while uh, uh, conserving and restoring marine and coastal biodiversity. Cognizant of the fact that the countries, our countries, will not be able to make uh, the investment on its own, we call on other countries with means and organizations with resources to partner with us on this very, I would say, very unique journey so far. Because of the complexities of ocean governance, a paradigm shift from the traditional state-centric approach to a global one is needed. One that is inclusive of all actors, state and non-state alike, with multiple knowledge, diverse values, participation and negotiations. Uh, uh, small islands developing states, uh, of course, we all know as seeds, through their multi-actor participatory processes are also joining forces on the international scene through and GLISPA to raise us and better understand uh, the realities vis-a-vis -vis climate change and the need to conserve and protect the ocean. They are also using these platforms for sharing of knowledge one another. And mindful of the fragility of the coastal and marine ecosystems, many seeds have been uh, moving towards sustainability through more protection for regeneration of these resources. Many have joined the 30 by 30 uh, Ladies and gentlemen, all that I have spoken about so far cannot be meaningfully contemplated without a better understanding of our oceans from an empirical evidence perspective. on the availability, up-to-date data, which in turn relies on continuous technological advancement. Modern oceanography thus has far been propelled by technology from the likes of submersibles that ticketed boys and samplers, monitors a wide range of sea surface conditions, automatic weather stations that monitors the weather, sonar that helps map the seabed to weather and monitor. Current and future technological prowess will deliver data collection and storage capabilities at speeds beyond our imagination. Artificial intelligence algorithms will be able to in real time, allowing for quicker responses to problems. The next generation of environment satellites, for example, will be able to observe our planet even more closely and in more ship tracking technology that will help in tracking ocean stresses like illegal fishing and other maritime crimes. They will also fill the gap between ocean governance, mechanisms, and the lack of monitoring and enforcement. Technological innovation with the right governance framework 
will be the determining factor in shifting our focus beyond sustainability to even more protection for the ecosystem to allow for the regeneration of biodiversity, ensuring reproduction to sustain livelihoods of people. It is all about balance, a planet in balance. I wish you all a very successful webinar. I thank you. President James, thank you very much indeed. A, a virtual a round of applause from, from our audience, our international audience. Thank you very much indeed. Um, one question, uh, please. Could you just comment on how optimistic you might be about the current negotiation of a, a new agreement on uh, BBN, please? And I also wonder, as we as we all dwell, I'm sure, on what's going on in Ukraine, how we've seen uh, nations rally around and, and make things happen, whether there's a lesson there as, as this climate crisis really starts to bite. Do you think that we'll start to get agreement on uh, uh, neg negotiations such as the BBN, please. Uh, personally, I am always uh, uh, optimistic, always optimistic. And uh, I think uh, the human race uh, has always been uh, at its best when it is at its worst. So uh, I think we should be positive and uh, and uh, uh, the leadership of different countries should come together and uh, ensure that uh, we move forward on, uh, on, that, uh, on, on that question because it is the only way uh, forward. It is the only way that we can ensure that uh, uh, we achieve full protection of our ocean and in the end, finally, uh, save life on the planet. Yeah, your, your umbilical is ringing in my ears. Uh, President James, thank you very much indeed. Those are, as always, thought-provoking remarks and, and a great uh, opening keynote for us. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, with no further ado, I'm going to go on to uh, my colleagues, uh, Kevin Fleming, who was the project director, and uh, Dr. Kieran Bergstrom, who was our lead researcher, um, who did the, uh, the work under the guidance of the uh, Sargasso Sea Commission team and the expert group that David Friesen have pulled together. And with no further ado, Kevin uh, and Kieran, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nick. If you could just confirm you can see the slides that are now on the presentation. Ali in presentation mode. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, good morning, afternoon, early morning, uh, all. Um, Kieran and I uh, are both delighted to be part of this excellent event uh, and um, to start with such inspiring words from President Michel uh, and I'd like to think there's some resonances as we go through our, our report um, uh, this afternoon. We're very grateful to the Sargasso Sea Commission clearly for asking us to undertake this very very interesting work and, and Kieran and I have grown into it in excitement throughout the time uh, and also to the IUCN and, and the Swedish government for funding it. What we'll do now is we'll briefly present to you uh, findings of our research that we detailed in our interim report that Faye has kindly shared with you. Uh, Kieran will begin by explaining the purpose of the report and some methodology, after which I'll outline the need for improved high seas governance. I suspect many on this call, if not all of you, will, will really understand that will be a brief canter. Um, and then I'll put forward a simple cycle to achieve that, a sort of a generic cycle and then a cycle that is uh, technology enabled. Between us, we'll outline then what we see as the art of the possible in brief terms. We won't go into the tactical detail um, for sensors, for big data and for AI. And then Kieran will talk more specifically about AI for ecosystems and ocean governance and how AI enabled wisdom uh, underpins the ocean governance cycle. Kieran will then set out a vision of future ocean governance and describe the path to technologization. And then I'll be closing by asking what next? The when, the what, the how, and the what with, and perhaps more importantly, the who. So without further ado, um, let's get cracking. Uh, Kieran, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Kevin. I, I don't need any of my PowerPoint notes after that. I've got I've got it all in my head. <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you. So, so report purpose. Um, what's the point of this report? Well, we wanted to understand fundamentally 
what problems can big data and AI technologies address in high seas governance? That's a, an easy sentence to write in a slide. It's, it's a harder one to grapple with. So what that really constituted is, what are the intrinsic challenges behind Pisces governance and which of those can we can we separate out, can we target for technological solutions? And this might be technological solutions in terms of enabling policy decisions, um, enabling governance on, 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 on the soft side of things, or this might actually be the type of technologies that enable the enforcement of gov governance, it's credible implementations. There, there are two sides to that problem, and it's quite difficult to pick out the right parts to target with technological solutions. It's certainly not every aspect of it. Um, we wanted to understand what the opportunities were, the challenges, the enablers, and also the starting points. It's all well and good to say technology will make a difference. I think we hear that every day from someone or other, but exactly how and uh, and where do we start? What do we do first that will deliver a, a meaningful meaningful value and lead to this, this sort of greater technologized vision? Um, and also, I think we, this was a question we came to as we grappled with the problem whole, how does this extend to ocean governance and management more broadly? We started with the high seas and by the end of it, we asked, is this only for the high seas? Does this, uh, does this bear greater relevance? And I think to, to answer that question right at the start, the answer is unequivocally yes, it, 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 tr it truly does. It, um, it, 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 I think, can deliver specific ben benefit to the high seas and it's perhaps also in some way specifically challenging in the high seas, cover, uh, high seas context. But big data and AI oriented solutions and improved remote sensing in all sorts of fashions will benefit ocean governance in the broadest of contexts. Um, next bit, please, Kevin. So our approach, well, fairly simple. We wanted to start by reviewing the state of the art in enabling earth and space based remote sensing technologies. What can we sense? What can we do? What is this data that we're talking about slightly vaguely? What does it really constitute? Therein, how do we sew that together? How do we sew this disparate set of observation into big data systems? And how does that really benefit ocean governance? This is a problem of enormous scale. You know, that, that, that's why big data has its sort of reputation as its own area of technology. It's handling a, an inform, a scale and velocity of information that is almost impossible for sort of the human operator, the human interpreter. So therein, what do artificial intelligence methods and algorithms of varying sophistication from the, the completely standard and well implemented across, across um, technolo te technologized industries currently to the far more cutting edge, far more bespoke? How can this actually help in converting big data into knowledge, into wisdom, as, as Kevin was saying, to enable ocean governance? And also, how can we trust it? How can we have the level of confidence we need in these systems in order to rely on them to help us make policy decisions? And, um, and then we wish to contextualize this in terms of stakeholder needs, priorities, and social societal values. We really did not want this report to be a technical document suitable for, uh, for universities and academics and uh, the PhD project here and there. We wanted this to start to guide thinking in what we could do. What we didn't seek to do, we didn't seek to formulate policy. That was beyond the scope of this report. We didn't seek to architect technically deep solutions either or perform first stage feasibility tests or experiments. This was about what one might do and what the art of the possible is and what that really means for ocean governance, not specific implementations that we'd sounded out in full detail. So a quick note on methodology before we begin as well. We took what would be conventionally called a mixed methods approach and this was so that we could balance our own investigative research and an understanding of stakeholder views. Um, this constituted a limited stakeholder survey of domain experts and end users, the Sagasso Sea Commission's um, expert group and end user group to understand the needs and priorities for improved um, governance in areas beyond national jurisdiction, to explore the state of the art as it's currently used and from an end user perspective, and to identify key solution goals to start to ask the question of what does good look like? Um, this also involved a series of targeted interviews and domain experts. This was really to, to zoom in on key examples to get a rich and qualitative picture of both good and poor ocean governance, and therefore to, to sort of make specific statements on how we can improve things. And um, this also, following this, um, these phases, we had a research phase where we included maritime, domain, blue economy, ecosystems, and emerging technologies experts to try and suggest what solutions were. 
Um, this has had an internal peer review passed by the Sargasso Sea Commission's expert group who had a look at our, our, um, our interim report and we've since then um, modified, modified the report according to their, their recommendations and insights and um, we hoped to publish this as a white paper but to use it to inform academic work in, in traditional journals as well. Next slide, thank please, you, Kieran. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kieran. I'll just uh, say a few words about the need for improved uh, high seas governance, uh, just to, to reiterate that this is improved because high seas governance does already exist uh, set out in UNCLOS, but it's almost 40 years since it was signed and is now really no longer fit for purpose. It needs to improve for, for various reasons. Um, to this audience, I don't think we need to spend too long uh, making the case, but I do think it's worth highlighting just a few points. Uh, the proliferation of industrial use of the high seas uh, has been uh, considerable. It's accelerating and it's not really in an equal or equitable manner either. As ever, the wealthiest are able to exploit it to the potential detriment of the poorest. There are new uh, and emerging threats to the ecosystem from unregulated, uncontrolled and often unseen seafloor mineral extraction activities and the e increasing harvesting of marine genetic resources. Uh, and problems outside EZs migrate in. The oceans are vast connectors in what makes them so essential to the planet, uh, but it's not without its drawbacks. Human-induced damaging impacts to high seas ecosystems can affect coastal communities literally half a world away from the source, and the impacts are particularly felt uh, by large ocean states, uh, as President Michel has said. Um, perhaps uh, uh, the most accurate way of describing them, because that's fundamentally what they are. Um, and as ever, a picture speaks a thousand words. So. Um, this graphic from a 2019 study, uh, an excellent graphic, it, it, it analysed the flow of surface water from areas beyond national jurisdiction to the coastal zones of both Somalia and Senegal. And they paint an extremely clear picture of this phenomenon and the vast distances that, that um, activity in one area uh, can impact on others. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a thing that exists and it's a thing that needs to be controlled in a much more uh, careful manner. Um, so what else in terms of um, uh, the, uh, the need? So there's a sense, as I said, that UNCLOS was really never completed. It was the best governance structure for the extent of knowledge at the time, uh, but it's very much overdue for review, revision, and I would argue reinforcement. Uh, the ongoing discussions that will take place soon, IGC4 regarding ABNJ or BBNJ, depending on, on your approach, uh, which many of you perhaps are involved in, I think will be absolutely key. Um, this could be where the paradigm shift really in the contemporary art of the possible uh, with access to big data and truly transformative AI methods uh, will have a critical role. Uh, and the final point of need uh, that is really worth pausing to consider uh, when we think of the high seas and oceans is where the three key constituents can collide, the environment, the ecosystem, the biology, if you like, uh, and the human activity. Um, we're not separate from the from the biological ecosystem, clearly, but the human activity does have a unique impact on this highly complex um, uh, space. And this complexity, therefore, necessitates sophistication of technique to develop a better understanding of the interrelationships between them. And it also requires a persistence of vision to sense and monitor 24 7 365. It is a long, continuous game to, to create this understanding. So what does good governance uh, look like? What's a cycle? So we had a look at a generic cycle. And if you sort of focus on the top middle uh, lozenge, you really need to simply collect information to create evidence. You need to analyze that to generate understanding, which then can be used to inform policy and their subsequent governance solutions. And these can then be used um, to allow you to monitor and enforce those governance measures um, uh, and then you can determine how effective they are. You can reflect, modify, and then go back to the beginning and start that cycle again. Um, and so that is sort of a, in, in a generic term. But we then looked at the technology enabled cycle. And, and it's a little bit more than just adding the words technology, data and AI to this, but, but because it, it pulls out the, the sensors, the technology side of life that, that we sit in 2022 able to access. Uh, in a relatively coherent and affordable manner in a way that we haven't in the past. Um, there's a lot to talk about in terms of earth base, earth and space-based remote sensing, which I'll come on to shortly, um, but also the, 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 the wealth of the data, the scale, and as, as Kieran has said, the velocity of this data, uh, we, need, we need some help. The human brain does not quite cope with all of that. And so we can leverage AI and machine learning um, 
to really get to to understand the patterns, understand the correlations, understand the causes um, of why things are happening. And that then in the modern world, evidence is key. Evidence based decision making to form policy uh, is absolutely vital. Uh, you can't just make things up on a whim and then move that forward. That will inform uh, enforcement action and also the, the sensing techniques can also or the sensing capabilities can not only um, allow you to see what's going on, but it can provide evidence. Uh, and evidence in a courtroom and that is again a really critical part of, of how you can uh, affect um, human behavior and change it and then the final part of course is to measure its effectiveness and then again going around the, the loop to make sure that what you put in place is actually having the desired effect uh, that you wanted um, a little bit from me about the art of the possible in terms of sensing um, uh, President Michel has already talked about more space based. Um, and again, I'm not going to knife and fork my way through all of this. This would take a, a good day or two in itself. But but suffice to say, space based sensors are far more numerous. They're far more. They're still not cheap. I couldn't afford one, but they're far more affordable. Um, uh, but they are giving us an increased coverage both geographically by altering um, uh, uh, satellite orbits and also in frequency. Uh, in, and I mean that in the electromagnetic frequency uh, from all uh, scales, from from infrared right to ultraviolet and everything in between. Um, it is a really um, uh, incredible uh, growth. Uh, and then we get into the beyond visual, uh, into synthetic aperture radar and so on and so forth that, that, that this audience will be familiar with. But the great, greatly reduced latency is really quite important, too, uh, particularly when we're talking about the policing and the jurisdiction aspects. Um, and uh, very recently, I've seen um, satellite companies talking about trailing pairs where you have an initial satellite in orbit, which is looking in a wide um, area. Uh, and then that cues based on what it sees, it, it cues a trailing satellite to look through the, uh, if you will, the um, uh, the drinking straw to gain more detail, to gain more understanding of exactly what's going on. Uh, and that sort of thing is is getting much uh, closer together, um, uh, even to within hours. And that's uh, that's quite an exciting part, I think, from a space based. Uh, but we're talking about the oceans. Um, so sea based sensors are absolutely fundamental. They always have been and they always will be. You have to get your feet wet uh, in order to know what's going on in the ocean above the water and underwater remotely operated are growing. Uh, they can cooperate without human interference. Um, and they, are, they of, often operate with extreme endurance and they're very carbon friendly. So from that perspective, uh, they're, they're quite an exciting opportunity there in, in the art of the possible with senses. And then on the water, I think akin to AIS, um, uh, and um, some of you may be familiar with Ferrybox, I, I, I wonder whether there is an appetite for mandating um, on all vessels above a certain tonnage that they should be mandated to take certain uh, collect certain data and then share that not necessarily in real time because that might cost them money in terms of bandwidth and so on but when they get to their home port they could share that information make that easily available uh, and i think that's quite an exciting opportunity uh, and then finally uh, not only about contemporary data but historical so call it already sensed data archive data is a potentially huge uh, but untapped resource um, particularly for the environment, which changes over eons, but it does have applicability in understanding how an ecosystem develops as a result of changing human activity over, over human lifetimes and so on. So that's a quick canter through uh, the needs, a bit of the governance, uh, and then uh, the art of the possible on, on sensing. Uh, I'll now hand back to Kieran for uh, art of the possible on big data onwards. Kieran, please. Thank you very much, Kevin. So. Um really contextualized by the plethora of sensing methods Kevin has just mentioned, it's quite clear that ecosystem analysis is intrinsically a big data problem. That's an enormous variety of data sources and data types that somehow need to be brought together into a, a meaningful combination. Um, and and that, that resonates with one of, the, one of the main themes we found in our surveys and in our interviews, a consistent barrier to justifying and implementing ocean governance is the availability of high confidence evidential data and analytics. It's very costly to generate. So establishing a big data picture is not just ideally, in fact, establishing a big data system is not just about piecing this information together for one purpose or one piece of policy. It's about creating this broad mechanism and data infrastructure that makes our data operable from a variety of sources, from archival sources, from current sources, from future 
data collection paradigms, like prevailing platforms of opportunities, as um, as, as Kevin mentioned. Um, certainly, I, th I think intrinsically that that's all about data sharing, really. That, that, that's the central theme here. The problems of big data and the, the systems and the technical implementations are mature in many different sectors. I, I think it would be an exaggeration to say it's a solved problem because there are always new aspects, but it's one for which there are many solutions, undoubtedly solutions that can be translated to the ocean sector and, and that do not seem to be translated to, to the extent that, you know, that would be possible. However, that, that's not the whole of data sharing. Data sharing isn't just a technical solution. A reuse, Sure, it's also about making it easy to find data and to use data, whether you're a human or a machine, an expert or perhaps a technical expert, or perhaps an expert in, 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 in maritime policy or in, um, in, in biology, not data science. It's also, I think, very importantly and sometimes missed, it's also about making data very easy to share. A lot of this data comes from scientific endeavors or, um, or, or, or charitable or philanthropic activities. Data sharing can be tremendously costly and it's a perpetual overhead. It's not a one-time cost to share data. It has to stay up there and remain accessible, remain findable. So, um, so there, there is a barrier to sharing just as, as there is a barrier to access. And these are the types of problems that need to be solved from really ultimately from an end user perspective for all, all the gamut of end users. Um, Addressing big data issues and, and sewing the big data picture together can also be informative. It's, it, it will do more than provide evidence on how ocean ecosystems are changing and how we are impacting them and therefore what we should try and do to, to prevent or mitigate damage we're causing. It will also help us understand what data to gather. It, 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 it tells us what to gather, what, what really constitutes data value, how much is enough and through which ways, which assets are we talking about? Space-based data gathering, are we talking about platforms of opportunity? How do we combine these in a manner that provides us the maximum knowledge, ideally at, at the minimal cost or more so in some way that's actually feasible, feasible for what we're trying to achieve. And of course, key to this is also maximizing knowledge and evidence retrieval from our existing data and our archives, which aren't necessarily digitized. You know, that as, as, as Kevin was saying, these go back a very long way. Kevin and Nick have both shown me you know, examples of um, of captain's logs that um, that have not yet been digitized, but do tell you all sorts of interesting things about climate. So there, there's there's a very very long arm of history there. Um, I think the um, one of the evidence in the room, though, when we do when one of the elephants in the room, when we talk about big data and evidence is how we incentivize and enable data sharing. And an important aspect of this is recognizing, traceably recognizing the social good. That data is providing. Being able to say that this data is what enables us to implement new policy and enables us to better protect uh, our ecosystems. And that traceability will in turn allow the recognition and then the funding for further data collection exercises. And this is a problem felt acutely at the scientific side of things. There's also an aspect of data trust and non-rivalry because it, it isn't enough really for sci science and um, and, and philanthropy be, to be the main sources of data, we need to have, have a data sharing picture that enables, um, that, that, it, that includes, sorry, that includes corporate and industrial users of the ocean, ideally. And if I could have the next slide, please, um, please, Kevin. I, there, there's a view that, this is a, a, an image from the front page of The Economist some years ago, and there's a view that data is, is the new oil, that it's the most valuable resource in the world. And I, I, I think, Uncontroversially, were I in a room, you know, to, to the economists in the room, I say that's wrong. Data by itself does not have a great deal of value unless you're a, you have a monopoly on data. If you have a million phone numbers, having a million more doesn't tell you anything else. Data sharing has value. And for most users of the ocean, that value is as of yet unrealized. So it is not a matter, it is not, a, it is not the intrinsically the case that you give away your competitive advantage by sharing data. It is not that data is rivalry. And there's a message there that we need to communicate. That also helps us build trust because if everyone's involved in providing the data, they also believe what the data says and they're involved in generating the solution. Um, moving from data to AI, we've spoken about big data volumes and velocity. How do we handle this? Well, we use AI methods to handle this and this goes, goes at, at numerous levels. One level is that we codify expert processes. 
We take the things that currently a small subset of global experts are capable of doing in terms of analyzing ocean ecosystems, analyzing our ecological impact, and we try to design simple, verifiable, trustworthy AI methods that do the same for us, that are distributable and, and equitable, that provide access to technology and solutions. We also try to see more from less. You know, a big data picture is not necessarily cohesive. It might be piecemeal. And we can use AI methods to not just stitch that data together, but to, to realistically, incredibly infer more things from it. And these are, are very traditional uses of AI that are, um, that are well demonstrated in, in numerous domains. More on the cutting edge side of things, we can try and capture complexity and understand causality and also quantify certainty in there. That's, that's very important. There are many emerging advanced methods that are designed to, to analyze highly complex, highly connected systems. Not necessarily ocean ecosystems. Methods will have to be tailored to the ocean domain, but broadly speaking, to capture complexity that humans can't quite grasp. An issue always when we talk about AI is transparency and trust. And much as, as with data rivalry, I'd like to push back on that notion. What started as black boxes are increasingly becoming clear. We're developing mechanisms to make AI methods transparent and to enable verification and validation of them. But these concepts and the importance of this needs to be baked in at the start of our process, not at the end. Let's go in with a hard requirement that we need to be able to verify, validate, and trust whatever AI process we might implement to enable ocean governance. So what's the approach? Well, the approach is one of translating and tailoring. Translate traditional AI solutions um, from other domains that are already mature, try and identify which ones work through targeted feasibility studies, and make the process of ecosystem diagnostic analysis and such easier today. And then in the long, in, in the long run, let's focus on cutting edge methods that will provide us new wisdom regarding ocean ecosystem behavior. And as, as I mentioned earlier, I think fundamentally, this is a path to equitable te technology. This is about democratizing expertise and making ocean management accessible. This can be based on open source data and open source algorithms with an accessibility far beyond what we have today. Next slide, please, Kevin. I thought I'd just, I'd just make a small a taxonomy, a taxonomy of, of data up to information, up to knowledge and wisdom. There are two points I wanted to draw out here. One is that data is actually less than information. Until we piece it to together and contextualize it, data has almost no value to us. The second point I wanted to make, which I think is more important, is that AI fits in at every single part of this techno taxonomy. It, AI can help us piece together data and just identify it. It can help us get information. It can take an image and recognize a vessel. It can help us generate knowledge. It can provide situational awareness, not just some notifications, but it can also provide wisdom. It can start to provide planning and solution recommendation. It can start to uh, pre predict intent. Vessel intent prediction is currently something that is coming out of scientific research using cutting edge AI methods and satellite imagery. So AI makes an impact across the whole gamut of, of activities data oriented activities that underpin ocean ecosystem analysis and governance. Next slide, please. At exactly the same point, I preempted myself there. AI enabled wisdom underpins ocean governance. So next slide, please. What does it look like? What could a vision of future ocean governance be? Well, I think the first point is fair standardized data that's easy to share, find, retrieve, and use for experts, non-expert, end users alike. I want to add one point. Oh, I've got the point in my next, my next bullet. That's the point I want to add. I, would, it would be ideal if this data is open source, a global commons of knowledge, open source data from the high seas enabling everyone to see what is happening to the ecosystems and to respond to that in an evidence fashion. I think we can have virtuous cycles, including industry for gathering and sharing data and knowledge. I don't think that has to be an adversarial relationship. And I think recognizing, traceably recognizing social good and so, so it might be a path to enabling this. Eco ocean ecosystem assessment that is radically less expensive and more accessible. I think that's completely achievable based on current big data and AI methods. I think we can reduce the cost of this significantly. I think we can democratize expertise through AI methods. I think as Kevin, Kevin's vision set out, we might even be able to have continuous ecosystem monitoring on a scale that is currently beyond anything possible. And all of this towards a goal of deep, consistent ocean understanding and, um, and ecosystem analysis. That is, um, that, that's a lofty goal though. Those aren't the targets for, for tomorrow, but they are perhaps the targets on a 10 or 15 year horizon that we can reach through clear and specific steps. So what's the path to technologization? Well, 
The first place to look is data standards and platform-based sharing, something that NASA is already leading on. I think the second stage is looking at feasibility studies for AI and technology translation, looking at data normalization, AI-assisted analysis in all forms, really looking at how we understand, monitor, and respond to ecosystem change underpinned by AI and big data technology. And lastly, we need to look at long-term AI solution development based on the type of big data systems that we're, we're developing. And this all needs to be underpinned by strategic center deployment and optimization to improve our 4D image of the oceans. Back to you, please, Kevin. Thank you, Kieran. Uh, it's always uh, a high data rate when you speak, and uh, but I always learn something new, even though we've been talking about this for months. So thank you for that. So what next? Uh, just the final slide. So much, or I would argue even all of this can be done now or indeed very soon, but it does need to be appropriately resourced. So who's going to do it? Who will be the global leaders in this vitally important endeavour? Is it you? Is it us? How does this impact on UNCLOS and on ABNJ discussions? The Sargasso Sea Commission is leading by piloting this approach. So I would say let's get started. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, chaps, and thank you for uh, um, rattling through that and covering all the uh, all the slides and that material. For anybody who's concerned, because it was a quick transmission, you will be uh, given the PowerPoint pack. I think you already have been, and you've got access to the reports. And if you haven't seen them, please do. Uh, please do engage with Faye. David, perhaps you could bring your slides up, please. Um, I'm, I have adjusted the timing as you won't be at all surprised, so there is no break, and my closing remarks will be very short. We may overrun slightly. Um, I shall now hand over to, to David. Uh, just saying, um, I, I see uh, we, people are starting to put questions in the chat. Please do put questions in the chat so that Kevin and Kieran can answer them. Uh, whilst our other speakers continue. So David, no further ado, you're going to talk to us about um, immediate next steps from the Sargasso Sea Commission perspective, please. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, Faye, thanks for putting the slide up. I was just having a little fumble around there. Brilliant. So thanks, guys. That was really good, Kieran and, and Kevin. That's really tremendous. And I think it builds on some of the inspiring things that uh, President uh, Michel has said to us in his, uh, in his inaugural, for which thanks again. So yeah, we would we want to be the pilot for this. I mean, we we have we have money, not a, I mean, in this in this perspective, not a huge amount, but it's certainly the, the most we've had for some time. And this is something that we really would like to be able to take advantage of to, to the maximum extent that we can. And I see this particularly in two ways, right? First, in, in the sense of gathering the data for our uh, ecosystem diagnostic analysis. We've got some great partners there. Let's say something about that. Uh, so it's the data gathering for the uh, for the ecosystem diagnostic, and then also once we've done that, we also can use the human impact data, which we'll be gathering in order to formulate proposals for ocean governance. For for you know, I mean, we're talking, I suppose, restrictions on human activities. But we need to be much more aware of what's actually happening, uh, so that we can make a case for the. Uh, for certain activities, I mean, vessel routing, for example, or certain restrictions of fishing in certain types of area. We can't do this without the data, uh, and, and it's the absence of data which has prevented some of these uh, proposals from going forward in the past. So we see this as being a, a tremendous asset to us in what we were planning to do. And we've got the most amazing team to do this, right? Uh, already mentioned many of we talked about the expert group but we've uh, NASA already involved we've got uh, uh, Dr Eric Lindstrom to talk to us later but also his colleagues um, Vardis Santos uh, and uh, uh, and his colleagues uh, at the coverage project we've got the Marine Geospatial Ecology Unit, Pat Halpin's team at Duke is a major partner with us, uh, as well, of course, as uh, Nick Lambert's team. And, you know, BIOS, the Bermuda Institute for Ocean Science, is also doing a huge amount in, on, 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 the, on the water uh, uh, observations, which are a part of our, our, our work as well. Uh, we, we, so, so we want to be a pilot for this, so, um, to show some lessons from this, and we want, of course, to put this into a wider, a wider audience, a more uh, um, peer-reviewed scientific audience as well, so as, as, uh, as Kevin had suggested. Um, so and we also want to give, as I said, maximum publicity to this, so you, you all, please, will be partners with us in this. Um, we're, we're, this report will be published on our website. IUCN are also going to put it on their website as well. Um, we, we will pull together the results of this webinar 
and also with the, so that we're envisaging at the moment that the uh, the report will include the report plus the responses and people that take part in it. Uh, and then, you know, there are opportunities for this to be publicised in, in other places. Too late for the BBNJ4, which is starting next week, but I think there will be a BBNJ5. It might be in person. They might even have side events. So that might be an appropriate place. But in the meantime, we've got the GF project. We've already done a number of workshops. We've got the for French uh, for Femme project as well, financed by the French. Uh, so there will be a number of meetings and lots of opportunities for us to put this out and to be for this activity to be part of their financed activities. So we're very positive. We're uh, delighted with this report. Thanks for the excellent presentation and. Back to you then, Nick. Brilliant. Thank you uh, very much indeed, David, and uh, encouraging next steps. Uh, the questions are rattling in, observations are rattling in in the chat. Uh, what I'm going to do now is to hand over to Mina Epps, who's kindly going to give us a perspective from IUCN. And then after that, we'll go straight into the panel. Uh, please do keep answering questions um, in the chat as you see fit. And uh, I will, I will work with Andrew Hudson to pull the questions out uh, during the discussion period. So thank you very much indeed, David. Uh, Mina, the floor is yours. If you have some slides, please do share them. Have we lost you, Mina? He's on mute, I know, but maybe she's called away we may have lost no i'm here i'm here sorry great, about that great. well done <laughs> sorry i was just my, my now my, might have a wrong um background um but they're all members so thank you very much um um uh, i'm sorry there we go yeah i think you're still sharing your screen that's okay okay so thank you very much uh and special thanks to to you uh david sargasso sea commission and your colleague faye uh, for commissioning this very important report, as well as, you know, being um, a leader and kind of collecting all this kind of data and seeing how we know that ocean governance, I mean, governance is key for a healthy ocean, but even so is evidence and how we can actually use the big data and basically use artificial intelligence to analyze it. I think this was very, very insightful, but indeed it was very much a canter through the report and I can see some excellent questions coming up in the book. Um, so IUCN has been working on ocean governance for many, many years, um, and we are really delighted to see the, the next step that, that this, uh, this report has kind of paved the way to really look at the scoping and what is the, the latest and the cutting edge in this. Era. So that's a very, very usual, uh, useful foundation to build and move forward on this. Um, I just wanted to point out also, as we go, we're talking about in relation to, to BB&J, um, it's certainly not too late to really emphasize the need for, you know, both monitoring, control and surveillance, but also these data. And within that light, I also like to um, highlight uh, that the trend that we're seeing that more and more research institutions are really using the FAIR principles, which is definable, accessible, interoperable and reusable data. And how can you actually mix those with the, the care principles, which is really looking at you know, the, the principle as well from an indigenous people's perspective and accessing data. So there was actually a really excellent paper um, produced in Nature which really looked at operationalizing the care and fair principles. So I think that's something to also have um, in, 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 uh, in mind. But um, so I know that we're cutting into the break here or I believe that has been uh, skipped. So uh, we're grateful as well for, for Sweden, the government of Sweden for continuing to, to sponsor our um, ocean and climate work and um, for also the leadership of Sargasso Sea to commission this report. So uh, without further ado, um, we're looking forward to um, fruitful negotiations next week, but also to listen to the discussion that you will be uh, moderating shortly. So once again, thank you very much and thanks for the opportunity to join and listen in. Excellent, thank you. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Mina, and, and, and thank you to the, for the support of IUCN, if I may, for uh, what the Sargasso Sea Commission has done, because I'm with you. I think it's a great initiative. And I do. I, I'm, 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 I like uh, James Michel's point, uh, optimistic. We can do this. We really can do this. And I, I'm passionate about the fact that nobody should be installing any uh, infrastructure in our seas or oceans or taking a ship of any kind to sea 
if they haven't got a sensor of some sort on it and be gathering data. There's no excuse for it now. We've just got to overcome that cultural barrier and get them all doing it. So with that bit of passion out of the way, on to uh, the panel. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Andrew Hudson, who's kindly agreed to chair uh, our expert panel this afternoon. Um, so Andrew, who is the head of Water and Ocean Governance Programme at UNDP, another great supporters uh, of the Sargasso Sea Commission and their initiatives. Andrew, if I may give you the floor, please, uh, to introduce your experts and to, to moderate a discussion. And, and hopefully you'll be able to multitask and pull out questions from the chat as you get to the discussion period as well. And the other great advantage of this, of course, is that people don't have to list, listen to me for another 40 minutes, so which would be a good thing. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Nick. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, David, Faye, and others for organizing this very exciting and, and really unique um, gathering of, of people today on uh, big data, AI, and how it can play a role in ocean governance. Um, <clears throat> so next, you know, there's already some really great questions and points coming in. I see from Alex Rogers and others. Very exciting. Um, we have you know, three quick speakers now to just shed some further perspective on the issue, some a bit more hands-on tangible um, stories about the role of big data and their respective work. Um, we're a little behind anyway, so let's, let's get right to it. Um, I'll go to our first speaker and uh, that will be Professor Catherine uh, Regwell uh, from the um, Oxford College, uh, also calls it Oxford. Um, and she's co-director of the Sustainable Oceans Program uh, at the Oxford Martin School. Uh, about five minutes, five to seven minutes. Catherine, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Andrew. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Um, it's a delight to be here and thank you to the Sargasso Sea Commission and to David for the invitation. Like David, I'm rather fond of densely packed slides, so I've had to exercise great self-restraint um, in the time allotted. Um, so I'm here in my capacity as co-director of the Oxford Martin School's uh, Sustainable Oceans Program, but as the next slide uh, reinforces, what I will be speaking about also draws on some research that's currently ongoing, funded not just by the Oxford Martin School, but by uh, the Prince Albert of Monaco Foundation. And it's on the use of satellite data for monitoring and enforcement of spatial management measures in high seas fisheries. And I've noted my debt to my two colleagues, Ephemius Papastrovidis and also Willem Rowlands, um, who's actually um, amongst the participants today. And his work with others on the Ascension Islands was actually cited uh, in the big data report. Um, and just to pick up on two points that Kevin and Kieran made earlier, um, Kevin referred to the use of big data as evidence in the courtroom, and Kieran asked and answered the question about this transcending issues of high seas governance and extended notions governance as a whole. And I would make the same point about our work on satellite data for monitoring and enforcement of spatial management measures. Um, it's not just high seas, it's not just fisheries, but it also applies, as we'll see in a moment, to remote areas within coastal state zones. So as we see on the next slide, just to sort of set the stage um, on the challenges of high seas enforcement, um, this is of course a major barrier to effective marine spatial planning um, and management in areas beyond national jurisdiction. As I'm sure this audience is only uh, too aware, there are currently only limited tools available for using area-based management tools or measures in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, so we have an inadequate tool set with respect to those areas. And even if we do have the capacity, the legal foundation for establishing, say, protected areas on the high seas, we have ongoing issues that we need to address in terms of compliance and enforcement. I was gonna say I have a frog in my throat, but maybe I should say an eel in my throat. <laughs> anyway, um, enforcement on the high seas is traditionally forced by flag states. We've had some innovations with port state control and even international agreements that allow for mutual or reciprocal enforcement between flag states. But ultimately, 
whether it's flag, coastal, or port state, it's dependent on enforcement action being taken under national law, relying on evidence of law breaking. And that evidence may well be derived from um, satellite surveillance and other remote methods. Um, but even though my focus is on um, compliance and enforcement, I also just wanted to acknowledge on the final point, as the report does, the importance of these tools um, as a broader context for um, ocean governance and management, not just end of pipeline enforcement issues. The next slide then, um, we turn to the lessons we've learned from national MPAs, uh, particularly in remote areas, which I think are highly pertinent for high seas management and for the use of big data. Uh, so the example I've given you here is from the 2016 Pitcairn EEZ designation of an IUCN category one no-take marine protected area. So that's the highest level of protection. And a review a couple of years after this designation, I think illustrates drawbacks which could be addressed uh, through uh, better um, or indeed any use of big data, uh, particularly points three and four, although you could argue that science-based design would be enhanced by access to big data and AI. Um, but of course, there are um, issues here about um, no local capacity for monitoring and our conventional enforcement capacity, a Coast Guard or other vessel, um, absent as well. Um, I'm getting questions popping up right across my slide from the chat, so apologies. Um, there we go, it's gone. Um, so a key plank in the efficacy of MPA designation, whether within coastal zones or on the high seas, is of course the use of innovative technology to monitor and enforce in these remote areas. And if we go to the next slide, um, this I think neatly encapsulates the lessons we can learn from the problems of national MPAs applicable to area-based management tools on the high seas. And this is of course the use of satellite data along with what we might call more conventional oceanographic sources, which will enable work to track and monitor vessels, whether in fisheries or other activities, and of course, um, to reduce risk to the MPAs and ensure preservation of the qualities uh, for which they've been designated. And then my final slide turns to the question of the top down versus bottom up question in terms of facilitating the role of big data. Um, we've already touched in the chat and in the discussions a little bit on the current BBNJ negotiations and IGC4 imminently. Um, and I think there is a role for more discussion there of innovative technologies for monitoring surveillance and enforcement. And there are two aspects to this that I would highlight in particular. One is recognizing the need for technology transfer capacity buildings and finance of tools for monitoring enforcement, including satellite data. But also, and I think crucially, and this is a link we can make top down by providing within any resulting instrument the need for domestic implementation that provides the facilitative foundation for the use of big data and AI from monitoring through to compliance and enforcement, and can also, of course, encourage uh, judicial trust of big data by ensuring for in a legal context, the availability and the reliability of such data. And I've given you one example, it's quite a simple one from the Pitcairns Island MPA ordinance of 2016, um, which was an attempt to classify within domestic legislation, how evidence could be acquired. Here it's in the context of fishing vessels, but one could very easily expanded out to other ocean governance issues um, and providing legal language that I've called future-proofed. Whatever happens technologically um, in terms of observation tools and techniques, the broad language of observation by any means to be included but not limited to, and then you see that long list of uh, various techniques, um, is absolutely crucial 
because there's no point having the data, there's no point having legal provision in any resulting BBNJ instrument if we have a legal gap at the real sharp end of implementing and enforcing, which is that domestic law recognizes that satellite evidence can be adduced, that it's admissible and that it carries weight, that it's reliable. And of course, um, that requires a legislative foundation and the Pitcairn Islands MPA ordinance is one example of that. Um, so I hope that's my seven minutes. Um, thank you, Andrew. I'm, that's the conclusion. And you're muted. Thanks very much, Catherine, for that overview. Very much appreciated. Um, let's keep moving. We have you know, plenty of time for a more open discussion. Uh, next speaker is a colleague of mine. Uh, Hugh Walton is the Chief Technical Advisor for the GF Financed UNDP Project in partnership with the Forum Fisheries Agency on Oceanic Fisheries Management in the Pacific. We've been working with ICE, with the FFA and FFAO <clears throat> and other partners in this project now for almost 20 years. Uh, and Hugh has a wealth of experience uh, welcome, Hugh. Please go right ahead. Hi, uh, yeah. Good morning and uh, good afternoon. Good evening, all. And uh, yeah, thanks, Sandy, for the introduction. And Faye has kindly agreed to uh, run my presentation through uh, through for me. So yeah, I'm with the the Forum Fisheries Agency, Pacific Island Forum Fisheries Agency, um, and I have been running the. Uh, um, GEF, UNDP, FAO, uh, Oceanic Fisheries um, Project um, for the last uh, five years. And uh, pleased to say that uh, we're about to embark on the next phase, uh, the third Oceanic Fisheries Management Project. So uh, I just want to give you a few kind of perspectives on where we're at with um, uh, governance of high seas ecosystems and the applications of big data and uh, and artificial intelligence. And I, I guess I'd start by just suggesting that what we're talking about is work in progress. So um, if I could have the next page, the next uh, slide, be there we are. Um, that's us. Um, it's a, as you can see, it's a huge big bit of the uh, Pacific Ocean. Um, the uh, the yellow countries there are the uh, um, independent ones and the green ones are essentially the territories plus Australia and New Zealand and the United States. But it's a, it's a jolly big area of responsibility. And if I could go to the next slide, please, Ray. Um, um, just by way of background, uh, we've got um, more than 30 million square kilometers um, which, does, which doesn't include Australia and New Zealand, 17 members. Um, there's really three key agencies, uh, the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission, the Secretariat for the Pacific Community Oceanic Fisheries Programme, and us, the Foreign Fisheries Agency. We've also got an important um, partner in the parties to the Nauru Agreement, which is uh, uh, a collective of, com of countries where the majority of the tuna in the region are caught. Um, and um, we're the world's largest and most productive tuna fishery, and we have comprehensive data sources. Um, a, a VMS, AIS, the Regional Fishery Surveillance Centre, log sheets, observer reports, transshipment, unloading data, tuna tagging, and WCPFC part one and part two reporting, as well as a comprehensive suite of WCPFC commission management measures. And I would just note that we do have one coordinating group called the DCC, the Data Collection Committee, which brings together parties from all those organizations, basically to say, well, what, um, what do we need? How are we going to collect it? And what are we going to do with it? And uh, I've been fortunate to be part of that group um, for the last few years. So next slide, please. Uh, and 
this is one that in our part of the world that we uh, we love to talk about. It's uh, essentially the giant green tower, and it took it puts oceanic fisheries, oceanic data fisheries, into a a perspective of who gets what, and um, and you know, green is good. Obviously, that's currently assessed as sustainable, and um, as you can see from the log, we've got a bit of unknown, uh, a bit of overfishing, and um, and uh, uh, overfishing occurring. So, um, this part of the world, with you know, really about two thousand, a uh, two. 2,700,000 tonnes of tuna a year, all being caught at what's currently estimated as sustainable levels. Um, next slide, please. Well, thanks, um, um, Faye. Could I have the next slide, please? Well, okay. Um, Sorry, no, is that you've, no, you've jumped one for me there. Um, there's one back, one back. Um, yeah, there we are. Um, so, um, obviously, with the world's largest tuna fisheries, one of the issues for us is illegal fishing. And uh, over the last uh, 10 years, we have managed two big uh, activities to look at the quantification of IUU. How much is going on? Who's doing it? What are the problem areas? What is, what's it worth? And how can we mitigate it? The first one was in a EU funded project um, that I was managing at the time. And that was um, in 2016. And the estimate then was that uh, the approximate value of, uh, best guess, approximate value of illegal fishing in the Western Central Pacific was a bit over $600 million a year. We, one of the recommendations from this, that study was that we look at it again in five years, having put mitigation processes in place um, and see where we got to. And that's what we did under uh, Andy's watchful eye and the uh, in the uh, OFMP project, and we just um, published that study uh, towards the end of last year and noted that really we'd got to as a, a best estimate figure of about $330 million. So over a five-year period, we had reduced the value of illegal fishing um, in, the, uh, in the region by about half. In terms of mitigation strategies, in our per seine fishery, we have had up until COVID 100% observer coverage. So we get pretty good data. We also have for the per seine fishery a requirement to transship and port and a requirement for electronic reporting rather than paper log sheets. Um, the issues for us are the longline fishery and the longline fishery operating on the high seas, where the observer coverage is much lower and uh, at about 5%, and the transshipment on the high seas is permissible. Um, so our focus needs to be on strengthening measures to monitor and validate um, uh, longline catch moves through the, through the um, supply chain. Next slide, please, uh, please, Faye. There we go. Um, so FFA, we have um, uh, committed unit within the organization, within the fisheries operations division of the organization called the Regional Fisheries Surveillance Center. And that pulls together the VMS and AIS pictures of every vessel operating in the region. And you can see it there. Um, it's a great big wall in a, in a particular building in the Forum Fisheries Agency. 
and we code vessels um, according to risk. Um, where we have um, green's good for go, amber is, hey, we're watching you, and red is, hey, we're really watching you. Um, next, please, next slide, please, um, Faye. And, you know, obviously, feeding into that, we have multiple data sources. Um, we have uh, high seas um, boarding and inspection. We have aerial surveillance. We've got port side monitoring. Um, we have got uh, at sea at sea monitoring and data collection from log sheets and various forms of of satellite upload. Um, so, uh, and then we've got. Uh, various levels of capacity in relation to data analysis. And I think the key point here is that at this point in time, the majority of the data analysis is manual. And that's where, uh, for us, um, the uh, AI becomes uh, potentially very important. Next slide, please, Catherine. Uh, okay. Um, where are we? Give me a moment. Yeah, so um, over recent years, since about 2014, we've started to play with electronic monitoring, um, cameras on boats, and in um, and, and various trials, and now in various capacities in terms of rollout. At this point in time, these systems have been what I would describe as manual in that the cameras are stored on, uh, uh, on the boats, the data from the cameras are stored on hard drives, the hard drives have to be manually unloaded and then manually viewed. So it's a... Uh, a very labor intensive and time intensive process. And we end up with these viewing centers with a bunch of people um, sitting there watching big screens and looking at the, uh, essentially the trip data. Um, and then that data can be, where there are observers, that data can be compared with the, uh, um, the observers that we have, the observer data that we have. The point being here that it's a very uh, uh, manually time consuming. Um, so, um, what are the issues for us? Next slide. Um, um, the, the issues hard drives, data storage, and hard drive transfer and the hard drive analysis and the manual systems applying to that. So I appreciate that we've got a huge area of, of, of ports. Uh, we've got uh, long liners, for example, returning to um, China and uh, Taiwan and Korea. Um, so we've got real challenges in how we manage the transfer of hard drives. And then once we actually get the hard drives, we've got these limitations of manual viewing. So basically we have to look at a whole trip. So what are the solutions? And this is where we are looking at uh, the um, emerging technology um, and artificial intelligence. So, in principle, looking at supporting advancing new technology, looking at greater utilization of direct satellite upload uh, of, um, of hard drive of, of onboard data and uh, cloud-based data storage. So we eliminate the need for the manual hard drives. And then we look at AI algorithms applied to the um, analysis and the key providers of the uh, 
uh, electronic monitoring technology are now well advanced in terms of the development and application of those um, logarithms. So um, next slide, please, Faye. Um, yeah, just to mention briefly, and um, uh, as I said earlier, we're in the process or have been in the process with um, GEF and UNDP and working through the development of a new um, uh, Pacific Island Region Oceanic Fisheries Management Project. And uh, so we've, we've done the comprehensive transboundary diagnostic analysis. We've done the strategic action program. We've done the project design document. We've got approval from GEF and we're about to kick off the new project. And one of the things that stood out for us in the new project is the need to support emerging technology. So we basically got three output areas that advance our ability to be able to do this and adapt to um, opportunities that come along. Um, so essentially that's strengthening onboard monitoring, observers and electronic monitoring and electronic reporting systems, um, improved frequency and access of accuracy of monitoring and reporting at the port level and looking at existing mechanisms for strengthening vessel tracking, as well as a tracking tracing um, provenance. So there is uh, in the uh, excellent report um, from, uh, from, the, the, uh, from, from the commission, there is mention of <laughs> using projects to advance the AI and big data um, capability, and I just wanted to point out that that's actually what we're doing. So we have got that as work in progress. And uh, I think final slide, please, Faye. Um, so just in terms of uh, uh, my take, and I couldn't speak for the whole of the organisation because I'm not sure that my uh, executive have had a chance to, uh, to fully read and, and uh, take in the, uh, the report. But um, uh, I think what I can say is that from our point of view, the report provides an excellent uh, review of the current state of play for big data and AI and the, the challenges associated with further advancing that. I think the report achieves its goal to articulate the potential opportunities in the application of big data and AI and supporting future ocean governance at the global level. And it's a great tool to utilize in the, in the advancement of opportunities to enhance data utilization for the mitigation of illegal fishing. So that's really, if you like, I think a, a more kind of practical look at what we're trying to do at the grassroots with emerging technology. And the key words here are emerging technology and the application thereof. And uh, uh, that's about uh, efficiency, getting better at what we do and mitigating the issues and challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hugh, and you know, really exciting to hear the, the extraordinary journey the Pacific Island countries have taken in you know, moving what is the largest tuna fishery in the world to 100% sustainability, including through the you know, collection, provision, analysis of, of data, the dramatic increase and improvement in enforcement, compliance, monitoring enforcement of the fishery. But as you know, there are steps, there are still challenges ahead and steps that need to be taken, which we hope to address in the next phase of uh, GF support. So we're going to move next to our uh, last uh, panelist in this session. It's uh, Dr. Eric Lindstrom. Eric was the former chief scientist 
uh, at Sail Drone, as well as a former physical oceanographer, uh, program scientist at NASA. And uh, Eric, the floor is yours. You're on mute, Eric. Eric, you thank are you. on mute. Yeah, thank you. There you thank go. You. Thanks. Yes. Uh, so sorry. Uh, so I'm Eric Lindstrom, and uh, yeah, I've been around kicking around global ocean observing systems for 30 years now. And uh, uh, so I've been living big data uh, uh, for many years and uh, also hoping to deliver something for the Sargasso Sea Commission in their uh, vision of uh, governance for the high seas, which is sorely needed. Um, so. Uh, unlike uh, others, I'm going to apologize for low density slides, and I try for high density message rather than high density slides. So uh, uh, I just wanted to tell you, you know, at the highest level, the global ocean observing system themes are about uh, climate, operational ocean services, and ocean health. And uh, we try and uh, direct all of our efforts uh, uh, into uh, those big themes uh, to which you can take advantage. Um, uh, 10 years ago, uh, I and a, a team uh, developed a framework for ocean observing, which has been widely adopted now uh, in the uh, global observing world. And it's based on the premise of uh, a simple system guided by inputs, which are what are your observing requirements? What does society want from the uh, uh, data? Uh, the process of observing and then the output, the collection of the data, the development of products and services that uh, would meet the user requirements. So you can find that framework for ocean observing uh, online by Googling that uh, name. Um, uh, in detail, it looks a little bit more like this where there are issues, uh, scientific uh, and societal drivers for information lead to some requirements and then what to measure. And we try and translate all that into essential ocean variables. So what variables can the technologies within the observing system uh, measure and collect? And uh, there are many the, of those the, from satellites, in situ, uh, uh, shore stations. It's, it's an immense network, uh, but still very sparse. And uh, then the idea is to assemble all the data along those ocean, central ocean variable lines. And then we get into the big data and AI models producing products and services, which we hope address the issues that were originally set forth uh, in the requirements. So that's the, the, the thing that everybody works under this umbrella keeps us all organized and uh, uh, in sight of the big picture. So uh, yeah, this is, you can see the flow through the system. And I guess I would say uh, uh, that we've been very successful in organizing the community around that. Uh, in parallel, over the last uh, 10 years, uh, I've been working uh, with David Freestone. Uh, uh, we have this project uh, under the Committee for Earth Observing Satellites called Coverage, which has got embedded acronyms. It's CEOS Ocean Variables, Enabling Research and Applications for GEO, the Group on Earth Observations. And it's a big deal to assemble the best to satellite data sets, in situ data, ship tracking, animal tracking data, and make it uh, uh, available 
uh, via the web so that anybody sitting with a uh, desktop internet access and the web can uh, manipulate and look at this data and anomalies and track things over time. And uh, uh, it, it's quite a beast of big data, uh, but uh, it is being organized uh, with NASA funding. And uh, the, it's, it's emerging this year from its, uh, uh, the build of the, the project to phase C, as we call it in NASA, when satellites are built, everything is uh, during, and then it will have a phase D trial uh, beginning next year. And we expect a lot of uh, use and abuse of the system by people in the Sargasso Sea Commission so we can make it uh, uh, available to you. I think in the future we'll include things like sargassum, which is sort of emerging as a, a central ocean variable. It isn't there yet, but it will. Um, so some of the uh, key observations I would make here uh, is that uh, the, the Sargasso Sea Commission defines a suite of societal uh, needs uh, for the Sargasso Sea and it and what is really important, I think, in the global system as deep uh, multinational support, so as to have a high credibility in the GOOS network and with the satellite agencies. And then uh, the, your strong attraction to big data AI resources for the precise information on ocean conditions and change uh, has, uh, it's enormously advanced. I mean, David's been leading this charge, and we we listen uh, here at, at NASA, or when I was at NASA, I'm still advising the coverage project to, to uh, try and make something that will be useful for the commission. Uh, but uh, this coverage project is uh, now preparing to deliver a big data package, uh, but that partner, the par uh, partnership needs advocacy and help in the beta testing during its phase CD in uh, 22 and 23. Uh, they just took a little bit of a hit on uh, funding a part of the project was ta maybe taken down here in the next few months. And so uh, we're sort of all hands on deck uh, trying to make sure we get to the finish line. Um, another thought here is that the in situ observing operational infrastructure is based on a 50 year old architecture with drifters and moorings and ships. And it does not yet include uh, uncrewed surface vehicles like sail drones and uh, uh, sampling for a lot of biological variables, so eDNA and how we're uh, uh, using passive acoustics. There's a lot of things that could be done uh, an expansion of variables measured by the system, but it requires new platforms new capabilities. And uh, so uh, there's a lot, a need for advocacy within GOOS to move from the past to the future. Uh, it's, it's a ponderous and slow system. And then uh, uh, I, I caution that uncertainty in the ocean information products will be, uh, that you get under big data will be limited by the ocean truth that really underlies those. So, uh, I would say, uh, in contrast to Kieran, you know, uh, tongue in cheek here, he said data by itself has no value. And I would say data is foundational to wisdom for ocean governance. I don't think he would disagree with that. So uh, I just, uh, as an ocean observer myself, we never like to hear uh, that there's no value here because people live and die trying to collect this data in crazy parts of the ocean. So uh, uh, finally, my personal recommendations coming into this uh, is that uh, the uh, commission uh, could decide to be more proactive and involved in the support of observing system evolution capabilities and use, make it fit for your purpose rather than somebody else's purpose. You know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease is in parent-teacher association meetings, you know, you got to speak out and have it your way. Um, and then uh, uh, the commission needs to recognize that uh, in-situ observing systems are evolving very slowly 
compared to the big data AI information generation capabilities. In that danger lurks, we can, we can get in front of our skis, so to speak, uh, and be making interpretations based on evident, poor evidence. The evidence is, needs to catch up, as, uh, as, we, as was pointed out earlier. Evidence is key. And then I think the su current situation calls for immediate attention by the commission to advance development and support for innovative ocean observing technologies and capabilities that support your big data AI objectives. So getting those uh, uncrewed surface vehicles, and new biological sensing out in the ocean is, is uh, really a, a priority and a, a, a case needs to be made for your immediate advocacy for those. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric. And um, let's you know, dive quickly into a few questions. Um, several have been posed, posted and actually addressed bilaterally, which is great. So please look at the, the stream of questions. Let me, let me jump first to, um, I think it was Gwilin, quite a question for Hugh. Basically, you know, Hugh, she wanted to know, he or she wanted to know um, what was the kind of main success factor behind the quite impressive reduction in IUU fishing that was achieved in the Pacific Islands over the last few years? Um, okay, yeah, no, that's a, um, uh, that's a good question. And I think um, was uh, a lot of it was about um, uh, improved observer coverage and um, improved monitoring of, um, of um, uh, shipment. Um, so uh, uh, it's really a, a combination of, in that first report, we actually had a, a whole bunch of suggested mitigation strategies. And what we did was start to try and apply those um, over the fisheries operations division and, uh, and across our members. So um, you know, it was really a collective effort um, across um, uh, um, a number of mitigation strategies. And I think the other thing is that um, the second time around, we had uh, better data coverage and better uh, improved um, uh, data, data analytical um, uh, capacity. Um, and we were starting to and did in fact use uh, some, what I would say preliminary uh, applications of, um, of um, uh, um, AI in terms of some of the work that we did with the, that the consultants did with the Global Fishing Watch. So, you know, no particular one thing, but really, uh, you know, uh, a, uh, a full spectrum. Thank you. Thank you. You know, so I'm seeing in the chat <clears throat> and, and the presentations <clears throat> that, you know, there, we know there's a vast amount of publicly funded data out there um, in the United States, the National Science Foundation, ONR and so forth in Europe, you know, similar things. Who can, can someone comment is, is at the present day, is most of that data that's funded publicly required to be made public? And, and even if so, if that's being done, is it being made public in a way that's accessible to users, decision makers, to the public itself, and in particular to the developing world, who of course do not necessarily have the data collection, analysis, and so forth um, capabilities of, of the North. Anybody wanna to touch on that question? Uh, Raise I your would... hand. Oh, Eric, you can go. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um... Yeah, the data sharing is really uh, difficult uh, unless uh, governments are funding uh, data collection for the common good, uh, it, where we get uh, data streaming in real time and uh, 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 delayed mode is freely available for everybody. So it's targeted at the common good. A lot of the new technologies are done under research and they're not available uh, unless uh, certain agencies that fund them uh, uh, make it so NASA does require all the data to be 
made publicly available. It does it all for the research for the common good, but uh, the National Science Foundation in the US doesn't. And uh, so it, it, it's very spotty and it's hard to build a global system based on a whole lot of hidden uh, bits and pieces. So uh, uh, the, it's really, I think, uh, uh, the, the best path forward to common data availability is to convince governments that this data is required and that the funding comes at the national level uh, uh, with requirements for transparency. Okay, thanks, Eric. And, and you know, the same point, maybe either uh, Alex Rogers or Catherine, um, what, what is the U, EU and UK kind of um, policies on publicly funded data access and availability? I guess Alex isn't a speaker here, but Catherine, do you have anything on that or, or, any, or anyone really? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. It's, um, it's actually quite a complicated picture, um, as you might imagine. Um, so open access um, certainly cuts against issues in terms of um, confidentiality and um, uh, privacy and respect of data. So it very much depends state by state and on contractual arrangements. Um, and I'm not an EU law expert. I think there has been some movement on this, but those of you who are at the, the coal face on data may well have um, um, insights to add on that. Yeah, maybe I can say something. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, only speaking, Andrew, from my perspective as a, a, a marine biological scientist, I mean, certainly grant, um, uh, grants given through government um, research funding agencies almost always come with a requirement to uh, publish data and, and make them available for the public. Um, we're currently working on uh, looking at a large scale biodiversity project. And what we found there is that in fact, even now we see a lot of data being stored in institutional bunkers, um, uh, people still inventing new databases where perfectly good databases already exist and so on. And I think this is the point I was trying to get at in my comment in that this is not just a technical challenge, it's a real social challenge which is going to require, you know, significant changes in culture, uh, certainly amongst the scientific community and I'm sure amongst many other uh, communities um, out there. Yeah, of course, yeah. And of course, you know, data is uh, essential to scientists to publish their papers, which is essential to their career pursuit. So we can see the background behind sort of the, maybe a protectionism aspect. Kevin, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Yeah, I, I sort of briefly answered it, uh, Alex's comment in the chat, but if we're talking about behavioral thing, then you've got to, it's, it's a sort of carrot and stick, really. It's not just about ocean data or any data for that matter. If you want to change human behavior, you've got to reward the right behaviors uh, and try and um, uh, and stop the bad ones. It's, I mean, that's easy to say, but very difficult to do. And it takes time, obviously. But how you incentivize researchers, for example, if you can, if you can isolate a, a part of their grant, for example, to say, at the end of this, you have to demonstrably show me where you've put your data and how easy it is to access. And not just for the next six months, it's got to be um, uh, from a, a lengthy perspective uh, for that for that matter. But of course, above that, there's got to be agreements as to you know, all the metadata and so on that goes around it, which again has been brought out. So it's a behavior thing. If you reward it, people will follow it, but it does take time. Thank you, and uh, Kieran, dive in. Thank you. I, I, as someone who never quite extricated himself properly from academia, I, I do have to say that I think academics are, are wholly, are broadly speaking, very willing. And, and they're, 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 in, they're in the profession because they have an eagerness to do something good and impactful. It's hard to share those data, though, and it's especially hard to share data if you aren't a data scientist or a data expert, including in the presence of a long list of standards that doesn't necessarily make compliance easy. So um, 
I, I find that there's often a culture of asking academics to do more and more and more within exactly the same budget, and it, it makes it very difficult to fulfill those requirements adequately, um, at least, you know, beyond the most superficial degree. So to me, data sharing platforms that automate as much of that as possible are, are, are sort of the solution, making that sharing accessible fundamentally, not just getting the data back out, but putting it in. Uh, David, freestyle. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Andy. Uh, and I wanted to thank all those, all our panelists for those tremendous uh, uh, presentations. I'm sorry that we're constrained by time. I think Nick's decided we can run over a few minutes, but uh, tremendous. I certainly follow up with Eric on his suggestions of, of further PR for moving forward this agenda, and we'll be watching what Hugh's doing. I had a question for, for Catherine, though, because I know she's been doing a lot of work with, with Gwilym, who's he, incidentally, on the... Uh, uh, on the issue of using remote sensing for prosecutions. Briefly, we're running out of time, but Catherine, you want to say a little bit about that in the sense of, you know, the, using this evidence? I mean, because, you know, one of the issues we've had with the fishing data, for example, is that the private sector is extremely reluctant to give us access to this. Yeah, thanks for that, David. And I'll encourage Willem to, to come in as well. Um, I think the key problem in the context of using satellite evidence in prosecutions is there's very little state practice indicating that this has been the sole basis for prosecution. Um, so this is uh, problem number one in fisheries enforcement. It tends to be the trigger for the uh, deployment of scarce conventional enforcement mechanisms. So. There is uh, satellite evidence, for example, of suspicious fishing patterns, um, but that then enables a state with scant resources to scramble its sole Coast Guard vessel or to ask an adjacent willing state to check things out. So I think in, in discussing this, the first point to make is that we're not yet there where in the main, um, judges and legal systems are quite geared up to use satellite evidence as anything other than an adjunct to what we might see as conventional uh, data collection. And that's true of international courts as well, if we think about some of the information that's been supplied on maritime boundaries <laughs> or in the context of um, international criminal law, it's alongside evidence gathering on the ground. Um, so that, that's point number one. Point number two is that, yes, it's a huge problem um, for states wanting to mount a prosecution to get access to the appropriate data as well. And I raised the question in the chat that this isn't just a real-time problem, but it's also if you're trying to backtrack to see if you can acquire satellite evidence to bolster a case in the context of a pollution incident, for example. Um, as well as fisheries enforcement. Um, so I think that the conversation we've been having about the accessibility of data and open access is absolutely crucial. And it may be a bit chicken and egg, isn't it? Um, the more accessible and reliable the data becomes, the more likely it is that it will be relied upon in, in judicial proceedings. Um, so it tends to be used where you've got big budgets and developed states and less used elsewhere. And the, sli the slide I had there on Pitcairn, I think, underscores the point. It is small island developing states in particular who would benefit hugely from the accessibility to data that they can't otherwise acquire through enormously expensive running of traditional Coast Guard vessels and the like. Um, so the sooner this happens, the better. Okay, so we've heard a lot about in particular, the social and cultural barriers to getting data shared and usable, not just technical barriers. And that's on the public side. There was a very good side uh, conversation about some progress in the private side, I guess, with the insurance industry as a sector that has found ways to make accessible and monetize uh, some of their data. So maybe there's some promising uh, possibilities there. I'm very much, I don't know if others agree, but I feel like this is literally the tip of the iceberg of what could be a much, much longer and robust conversation. There's so many inter interesting issues have been brought up here. So David, you might even consider having a follow-on event 
just with discussion, no, no presentations at all. So we can really, because people are clearly uh, quite uh, uh, excited and enthusiastic about this issue. Um, so I'll you know, consider this, this session, I think wrapped up for now, unless there's any other burning questions. But as I said, we could, we could talk about this for hours. It's very clear there's so much knowledge and expertise and ideas here. And maybe a, a follow on session could even generate some kind of actionable um, uh, items that we, we as a group could somehow pursue. A thumbs up from Eric, thank you, and uh, so forth. So with that, I'll turn it um, back to Nick for the true cl closing remarks for this really, really interesting session. Well, thank you. Thank you. A very, very big uh, well done to our panelists and uh, really fascinating, uh, fascinating revelations uh, from from Eric and, and Catherine and, and of course, from New Zealand. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, so uh, in the middle of the night there, um, I, I would actually give David Freestone the final, final word, but I'm, I'm just going to close by saying I'm not going to spend the next 10 minutes uh, wrapping up the remarks because there's not sufficient time for it. And I'm with you, Andrew. I think there's a, a conversation here which is running, which is very valuable. And I'm sure David will pick up on as he thinks about his next steps on the idea of, of further webinars. What I'm going to do is to thank everybody um, for their for their contribution to this session. Uh, and, and also to thank uh, the authors, if I may, to thank Kieran and Kevin for the work that they did in, in this study. You, you probably didn't realize that uh, David gave us a very challenging and short flash to bang uh, to do the work. And um, uh, the expert group rallied around brilliantly. And I have to say that I know it's a gray literature document, uh, but it was in terms of a short um, start, short notice start, and a uh, a quick, um, what's somebody's calling me, um, and a uh, and a very short timeline to deliver. I think everybody rallied around brilliantly to get the report uh, to the state it's at. Um, so to thank also uh, David for the the wisdom and the foresight to set up this challenge and to progress this from the Sargasso Sea. I loved the concept of the Sargasso Sea. I spent many years at sea, and I I, I remember very well a very wise old captain saying to me, we were pouring over a chart of, of, the, of oceans. We were, I think in this particular case, we were heading to the Indian Ocean. And he said, you know, this, this part is a beautiful ocean. And, and he was quite right, because you can, you can sense different oceans, as you all well know. And it's the same with Sargasso, as the Sargasso Sea. So uh, people who have passion for seas and oceans will quite, quite completely understand that. So thank you, David, for the opportunity to work with the Sargasso Sea Commission for the work that you do. Uh, the final um, thanks I, I will put uh, to, to Faye, who's uh, been absolutely with the admin uh, and the running of the study and also with this webinar. And so Faye, well, well done for you for so professionally cracking on and supporting us in the way that you have. Um, I'm gonna shut up. We will uh, produce a summary note um, of our discussions this afternoon uh, that, that Faye in her inimitable style will distribute with the presentations and the links and the videos and so on. And uh, of course, they'll be wrapped up into the next steps that David described. So I will now shut up and the last, absolutely last word goes to you, David. Okay, <clears throat> thanks very much, uh, Nick. Yeah, those very kind words, and again, e echo your uh, thanks to Faye. Can we all turn our cameras, uh, our cameras on, so that we can just ask Faye to another Ministry of Job just to get a picture of us for our uh, for the record of this? If you could just turn your cameras on, that would be great. If you're still there, uh, and thanks to to, to Andy for for uh, for the, the last panel. I think that was a great success. We we needed more time. I see this very much as I think I was saying very much as a beginning. So, you know, we're, we, we, we're delighted that ICN and the Swedes were able to get, come, come up with the money to, for us to start this, but it was going to be part of our French project. So we're hoping that we've got money to actually carry this on. But webinars are, you know, always good, you know, always a good way of stimulating conversation. So we, we see this as the beginning of the process. And I'm certainly sort of bear in mind that all the people we're looking forward to working with everybody that's uh, that been on. You've got photos all there. Alex, are you there? Can you turn yours on? And Willem, or not? You're just, I know you were just listening, but. Yeah, anyway. they won't be able to, but I grabbed right. a couple of okay. photos. Right. Thanks. Brilliant. Okay, well, so, so just say that again. Thanks again to Nick, 
I mean, you really did. Lots of others were were, were available, and I, I didn't. I realised I didn't mention by name uh, Paul Woods and, and Global Fishing Watch, but their business model is wonderful. I mean, they basically collect the data and then give it to people for nothing. And so they are an amazing partner and they're working very closely with Pat Halpin and his team at uh, uh, Duke. So these are great, as well as the wonderful work that NASA has been doing. But I always remember Eric saying, the NASA will take you to Mars and then you're on your own, right? So it's once you get there, we, we have to have a sustainable system and one that we can use. So the data they've got is fantastic. And we're hoping to use that technology for it. So again, not to delay. Thank you so much for, for coming. Uh, I think it's been tremendous, and but the beginning of this journey. So thanks again very much. I'm trying to wave to you, but I can't. It's hidden by this frogfish. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Bye now. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.